Hi, thanks for stopping by Next Level Carpentry. Uh, in the shop today, working on this uh, master closet uh, cabinet project. And today is the day for building drawers. Uh, the 24 inch cabinet and the 36 get four drawers on the bottom. And I'm gonna go through the process. Uh, the last few cabinet jobs I've done, the drawers have been made out of melamine, which is kind of a different process. Uh, but with these being stained wood cabinets, I wanted to make the drawers out of wood instead of melamine. Uh, melamine's nice in the kitchen, uh, stuff like that, because the surface is durable, you can always wash it. Uh, but a cabinet in a closet uh, shouldn't need that kind of cleaning or durability, uh, and looks is a little more important. So I'm making these out of half-inch Russian birch, and um, I just want to walk you through the unique process I use for making these drawers. Typical to when I start a new project, I go on YouTube and look around to see what's out there. And I haven't seen the method or the style that I use here. There's uh, features of it in different videos, but uh, this is a project I'm selling to a customer. Uh, they pay me good money to make these cabinets and uh, the drawers can't be marginal. So I'll just go through the process I use for making the actual drawers. Uh, I'm not gonna cover how I figured out the drawer size. Uh, that's determined on the hardware. Uh, I'm using this Hedich uh, soft close uh, drawer glide hardware and um, each specific hardware uh, determines the actual outside dimensions of the drawer and then the, uh, the height of the space and the number of drawers determines the actual height of the drawers. That's a whole separate uh, process. So I'm not going to get into that. I've just got the finished depth on these which is going to be 14 and 3 quarter inches and then uh, the width is like 23 and a half and 33 and a quarter, whatever the, uh, those end up being. But um, I'll go through the process of making what I call professional drawers for finished cabinetry. Here's the Hedich uh, soft close hardware I'm using. This little clippy thing is what holds the front of the drawer down. The back of the drawer hooks into this little hook in the back. And um, these pull out real nice and easy. And once the spring mechanism with the plunger is engaged, it pulls the drawer in real smooth and real slow. Because of the nature of the glide, the drawer has to fit over this rail. The bottom of the drawer covers it. So I'm raising up the bottom panel in the drawer a half inch to cover this rail when it's extended. And that uh, allows me to uh, put a dado for the door bottom Whereas on a melamine drawer, I just screw the bottom of the drawer to the bottom of the side pieces. I use a very hands-on method for calculating uh, the drawer size. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but I just take a piece of scrap and I draw out full scale uh, the height of the cabinet and divide it up like I want for the depths of drawers to suit the customer's needs for what they're putting in these cabinets. Um, and then I do, using that hardware, I figure out how much space I need on the inside of the cabinet so that the drawer goes in smoothly. It doesn't bind or get stretched, but I do this, you know, very hands-on. It's full scale. I just draw the stuff out and then measure what I got left. So that's how I come up with the size of the drawers. I've got this list here. Uh, the, the heights are three and a half, five and a half, seven and a half, and nine and a quarter. And then um, the front and back pieces are 33 and a quarter for the wide cabinet and 22 and three quarters for the narrow one. Uh, so that way I have the quantity and the sizes that I need and I can lay it out for the most efficient uh, use on this five foot square half inch Russian birch plywood. And for part layout, it only makes sense to start with the longest and widest parts first. Even though Russian birch in a five foot square size is different than the four by eight materials I'm used to working with, it can really work out nice for uh, parts like this, it's just a matter of shuffling around uh, to get the maximum yield. And I didn't script any of this, but uh, there's a lot of thoughts that go through my head when I'm doing this. And one of the things is um, basically by cutting out the cabinet parts, I'm determining how big the scraps are gonna be that are left over and get thrown out in the end. Uh, in this case, no matter how efficiently I cut these parts out, I'm not gonna get everything out of one sheet. So that means I need two sheets. <laughs> Great call, Einstein. Um, so I have to buy two sheets to get the job done and I'm not gonna use two sheets to finish this up. So I can be 
a little more extravagant on the way I cut out the parts. Uh, on this piece, if I cut the, the fronts for the wide and narrow cabinet out of this, there's about a four inch strip left over. That's not going to do me any good anywhere. So I can just cut right down the middle of that scrap. That way I trim off all the irregular factory edges and I can uh, move things around a little bit if there's some part of the grain that I don't want to use. Uh, this goes for this Russian birch. It goes for pretty much anything. And then when I get into the second sheet, that's going to work out fine for all the sides. And um, there'll be a fair amount left over. So I don't have to um, dial in and, you know, just take the dirt off the edge and nothing more. I can clean it up nice. Um, sheet goods tend to be slightly thicker at the edges. Plywood can be a little irregular throughout. But generally, uh, a half to three quarter inch in from the edge it's pretty consistent. Uh, so I, anytime that I've got this excess material, it's basically just going to end up as scrap. I choose to trim it off in a manner to get the um, most consistent results in all the parts that I'm cutting out. The other thing about this process, uh, it goes for any, making anything with cabinets, um, but particularly with drawers, is um, I need to make sure that I'm cutting each dimension throughout the whole project. So every side uh, that ends up at um, nine and a quarter inches tall, I've got to run all the nine and a quarters with one saw setting. Even um, if I move the fence back to nine and a quarter, I've got to really be careful to get these parts a consistent size. And it really shows up if you're off a 64th of an inch or a 32nd of an inch. So this, the quickest way and the most efficient way is to cut the sizes, uh, to cut all these parts in a sequence that I can run the final dimension all in one pass. It's a little less critical for the height of these drawers than the uh, width and the depth because of the joiner I'm using on the corners. So um, I've, I'll cut this stuff out. I'll cut all the pieces to length first, and then I'll cut them all to length after that. Uh, maybe that'll make sense as the video goes on, but I wanted to put those comments in here because I'm not just um, deciding, oh, I need um, two parts that are nine and a quarter uh, by 33 and a quarter and cutting those two parts out and then doing something else. Uh, I do everything systematically the best I can um, so that the final pass on all the parts is made with the exact same saw setup. That way, if something's the slightest bit strong or slightest bit weak, and I'm talking, you know, a 64th of an inch, it's all the same. It all fits in the cabinet fine uh, and get a great end result. Hope that makes sense. So I've already determined that I can get these nine and a quarter, seven and a half, five and a half, three and a half inch pieces by stacking them this way on the sheet. I want all the grain to run horizontally on the drawers. Um, I've seen a few drawers built uh, with the grain running vertically on the drawers. Uh, structurally, the plywood is fine, but it just looks scabby in my opinion. So I'm going to make sure all the grain runs horizontally on these drawers. But I can comfortably get 33 and a quarter and 22 and three quarters out of this sheet. So I'm just going to start off with 33 and a quarter. I'm going to go 34 inches and take a saw kerf right there. And then that'll leave me plenty for the 22 and three quarters with that scrap. And once I've got the 33 and a quarter inch and uh, 22 and three quarter inch cutoffs here, I'll go to the other sheet and I'll cut enough for all these pieces. Uh, for all the sides that are going to be 14 and 3 quarters, I'll just make a th three 14 and 3 quarter inch cuts off the end of a sheet. And I'll add another big picture word of caution here in that uh, this Russian birch plywood uh, isn't always square on the corners. You can see here uh, that's, that's a strong 16th in uh, 22 and a half inches. That's not going to be anywhere near acceptable for this drawer project. So at some stage, uh, as I'm cutting the parts, I need to correct for that error. I'm still able to cut my pieces uh, using this end uh, to index from, but at some point I'll need to square up this parallel edge to correct for this error. It's no big deal as long as you're aware of it. Checking the four corners of this first sheet, I notice that this one is very nice, so I'll mark it as square and then use this edge in this corner to index from, and that'll minimize the amount of correction I need to do later. Anybody that works in a small shop understands the gymnastics necessary for cutting large sheets in a small space. 
and tend to develop a workflow that's manageable in whatever their space is with whatever the tools they have. I've gotten plenty of questions on these outfeed roller stands and at some point I fully intend to do a build video for these guys because they work great for this sort of operation, especially for a one-man show like mine. 34 and a quarter, right? That way I've got an inch to trim. I've got a Freud uh, thin kerf crosscut blade in the saw. It's a great buy and a great value. Uh, it works excellent on this uh, plywood with a rather delicate veneer. Another thing when cutting large sheets, anytime I can, I put the widest part of the sheet on the table rather than let it dangle off the end. It's uh, just logical, but uh, it's worth a mention. And that goes for even if I just need the narrow piece, if I need a 12 inch piece off this, I'll cut it at 48 and then trim uh, the actual piece. Hope that makes sense. And I keep thinking of more things. Uh, on the factory edge that's going to run along the fence, I'll take one of my best blocks for demanding sanding. Uh, this one is 60 grit. And I'll wipe that edge to make sure there's no rocks embedded in there. And it takes out any little bumps and removes splinters that might skew the sheet as it goes past the rip fence. A quick wipe is all it takes. If there's any issues on that initial cut, I can move the fence over, take another 3 16 off for a clean edge because I left enough scrap uh, on the factory edge to trim it up. But that was a perfect cut. I'm happy with it. And just flip the sheet so the cut edge goes up against the fence. Blue Smurf gloves. Uh, help manage these sheets, especially when working alone. And now that I've got one edge cut perfectly, I'll trim the other side and I know that I get all my uh, narrow uh, drawer fronts out of one sheet and all my wide drawer fronts out of the other sheet. So they'll be identical in length, precisely identical. The narrow pieces are 22 and 3 quarters. combination of a sharp blade, a zero clearance throat insert, and a sensible feed rate mean very, very minimal roughness on the cut on the bottom side of the sheet. The edge is wonderfully smooth and accurate. The process for all the side pieces is the same with that second sheet. plywood kind of has an A side and a B side. I want the A side on the inside of the drawers. So I flip that over. That appears to be the unsquare corner. Ooh, boy, this is almost an eighth of an inch. So it may be that edge that's off and not the end. That would appear to be the case that it, the edges aren't parallel, it's tipped like this, I think. But nevertheless, here's a square corner, so I'll index from it. I've got plenty to work with for these uh, 14 and 3 quarter inch pieces. So I'll start out uh, leaving about an inch waste on that side, 15 and 3 quarters to a saw curve here. On some projects, the difference between using two sheets and three is a matter of soft curve placement. So I've got to really dial these things in and uh, it's pretty extravagant to leave that much trimming on the edge. But in this case, I've got plenty, so I don't have to stress about it. Um, I've got the one inch 
and 14 and three quarters laid out there. I'll put another 14 and three quarters on here generously. Let's just call it 15 inches. And that leaves a total piece if I rip this to oh, 031. Uh, I'll have a straight edge here and then I can make those two 14 and three quarter inch cuts accurately. And I'm just kind of letting the camera roll because this is what work in my shop looks like. A little more blade height. Got my favorite shop stool back here. Works great. There's a holding point for that. Clean up the edge. And I might clean up a dozen edges before I ever find one rock or flaw in that edge, but it's worth it. And uh, let's see, 31 inches is my number. Gives me plenty of margin for trimming. Roller stands are about set. I'm pointing to the rip fence where I have to make sure the workpiece doesn't rock on the fence. It has to be indexed and sliding smoothly exactly along the fence for accurate cuts. I'm confident on my cuts and the quality of this first cut on this sheet, so I'll just set the fence to 14 and 3 quarters and cut all my side pieces at the same time. If there's any problems with this first cut, I can cut this first one 14 and a quarter to get a nice true edge and flip those again, always working off the best cut I can to yield parts um, that are as accurate as possible. I'm not sure if it's obvious or not, but I'm always pushing down and in as the piece goes through the saw. I rock it here to make sure I'm happy with the way that's lined up. I've got enough rip fence back behind the blade. If I slide the fence that way, if I slide the fence that way and start feeding the piece crooked, it's going to ruin it. When I'm pushing the wide piece through, I'm very careful with the off cut to make sure I'm not pushing too hard on it so it binds on the blade. I don't have a riving knife and uh, I can get kit back that way. So uh, pressure's down and in on the workpiece, and then the other one just follows along. I'm not in a race here. I want to work fast and efficiently, but I don't have to push this through and see how fast the, stall, the saw will cut. It's much more important to get smooth, accurate cut so that the parts are identical when they're done. That's sweet. So with that sequence of steps, I've got all my drawer parts cut to length, the fronts, the backs, and the sides. Next thing is to rip them to width, and I need to make sure that I'm squaring things up as I go along. These edges are perfectly parallel, regardless of what the edges of the sheets are doing. Um, but this is when I have to pay attention to that before I start ripping these pieces off. And the size of the sheet and the number of parts I get out of these is a little bit forgiving, so I don't have to um, get my rips down so tight to the saw kerf uh, at the risk of needing a whole other sheet of material. I always like it when I've got a little bit of a uh, cushion there, which I do. So uh, to do this, again, I want to break the bigger sheet down to a more manageable size, and so I'll lay out uh, the two widest drawers, uh, the nine and a halfs or whatever, nine and a halfs and the seven and a halfs. I'll make a rip, square everything up, and then go to cut the narrower pieces. You'll see the process and hopefully it makes more sense. All right, I know I need to make two nine and a quarter rips off the bottom of each piece and then two seven and a half inch uh, rips. So I'm going to go one inch 
for trimming, nine and a quarter and a saw kerf, nine and a quarter and a saw kerf, seven and a half and a saw kerf, seven and a half and a saw kerf. <clears throat> and that's not precisely accurate because I've got a cushion down here in that one inch extra. And so uh, I'm just going to go 35 and a half inches for the initial cut. And then just verify that I can get the two five and a halves, which is that five and a half, five and a half. And then I've got three and a half twice, three and a half, three and a half. And you can see I've got uh, almost six inches to spare, even with pretty liberal uh, layouts of these pieces. So I can start with the fence set to 35 and a half inches and uh, break these pieces down a little bit. This corner is still nice and square, as is this one. And this one. Not that one. All right, this is the squarest one on the sheet, but it's still questionable. But uh, this is good enough for this initial sizing. It's important to clean up the edges just like it was cleaning up the ends. Thirty-five and a half is the initial cut. And I left this last cut in there. Uh, that's very marginal. The piece between the blade and the fence is uh, wider than it is long. Uh, the danger of this getting crossways in the blade or having something pinch or go bad is pretty high. Uh, I left it in there. That's the way I do it sometimes, but uh, I'm not advising that technically. Something that you don't know that I do is take a block of paraffin and rub it on the fence. And that keeps the piece from binding along that aluminum fence uh, and increases my comfort zone, but it doesn't increase it enough to do the narrow pieces. So I deploy my uh, Osborne EB3 miter fence and a special block I use to carry the fence past the edge of the table for these wider pieces. Smurf gloves are a real good idea for this kind of operation and help yield excellent results. There's all my initial cuts. And a lot of YouTube channels have a giant outfeed table, uh, overhead dust collection, riving knife, saw stop, all sorts of stuff. Um, that's wonderful for anybody that has it and uses it and requires it. Uh, I'd use it if I had it, I don't. Um, but this is how the process works. I'm constantly paying attention though to the uh, danger areas, uh, binding on the blade, kickback, and that sort of thing. So um, if this looks smooth and easy, there's a thought process going behind it and 
Um, there's occasions I have accidents, you know. I mean, it's, it's working in the shop, things happen, it's, it's rare, and, uh, but woodworking can be dangerous, so pay attention, keep yourself safe. Uh, all right, with those initial cuts made, I want to determine that uh, this edge is square to the ends of all these pieces on all these cuts. So I'll go through that process, and once I've determined inaccuracies, I'll show you how I deal with them. All right, I checked through all the pieces. Uh, the first stack uh, was, was pretty good. I didn't have to do anything with those. Uh, two pieces of the second stack uh, weren't so good. And I hope you can see this in the video. Uh, I know that the two edges are parallel because we ripped them at the same time. So if there's anything in question, it's the edge that's off, not the end. And I, I don't know if you can see that. It's uh, about a 32nd of an inch out of square on this corner. This is open. So I basically need to trim a 32nd to nothing off this end to make this corner square. And this is where accurate machine setup is really handy. I'm going to dial my joiner in to a skinny 32nd of an inch about there. And here's the trick to squaring a sheet in a flash. So I've got to take a 32nd of an inch more off this side of the sheet than this side. I've got the infeed table set a 32nd of an inch lower than the outfeed table. So I just park the end that doesn't need anything taken off on the outfeed table. If you can see that, there's a 32nd of an inch in between the table and the piece. I'll zoom in so you can see that little bit of space. Now when I plane this, it'll take nothing to a 32nd off across that edge. And I have to do the process in this sequence to be safe. And you can see by one pass over the joiner, that I've squared up the edge of this sheet to the sides to perfection, leaving me a square corner. Now as I make successive cuts, as long as I use uh, this edge to index from, everything will come out parallel and square in the end. This other wider sheet has a squareness deficiency as well. My battery is quickly dying. One battery down, one to go. I'm not sure where that died out, but you can see on this sheet, uh, there's a strong 32nd of out of squareness already. By the time it gets to the other end of the sheet, it's going to be a 16th of an inch. So I'll correct for that on the joiner. The process is quick and easy. So if your first guess isn't right, if you overguess, just flip the sheet end for end and make a correction. You can, and you can dial it in going one way or the other until you're happy with how square it is. And I got lucky on this first pass and I'm completely satisfied with that edge for squareness. And I guess I've gotten a reputation for digging in the weeds and going into detail and uh, not worrying about video length. So I'll pile on a little bit here and say that um, I've got carbide knives um, it's a helical head in this joiner and um, if you have high-speed steel knives in a joiner and you, you plane Russian birch on its edge um, and my old joiner or this one before I had the carbide knives, there's something, an abrasive quality about that glue. It can actually put little ribs uh, in your joiner knives. It doesn't do it with carbide, uh, but uh, if, you're, if you're doing this on a joiner with um, high-speed steel knives, you might want to crowd one edge or the other so you don't put little grooves right in the middle of the blade. And I'm not sure if that's for everybody's blades, but uh, a word of caution. I think that's about that. I'm going to rough these out to uh, make two of each width pieces. On those, it'll be the nine and a quarter and eight and a half, and this will be the five and a half and the three and a half. But I'll just uh, cheat them a little bit wide make a rough rip off the, off the square edge, and then I'll take the final setting um, to the final dimension off of everything. And for that, I'm gonna fire up the Gyro Air G700 dust processor, because there's a lot of cutting going on at the same time, and I'll just let the video run when I'm going through the process.
that is the world's quietest dust collector, but the sound of 1100 CFM rushing air in the shop uh, makes the audio a little bit hard to deal with. So I'm just going to work and not worry about the audio. This is pretty simple. I just lay out nine and a quarter twice with a saw kerf. And then just jump up. So I'll go 19 inches um, for this initial cut. And that'll leave plenty for the two seven and a half inch pieces that need to come out of here. And when I'm cutting a large batch of parts like this, I'm always mindful of the edges. This is a cut edge. This is a factory edge. When I cut this, this will be a truer edge than the previous cut one. So I'll turn the pieces around so they index against the fence for the final cut. And I'll make sure I don't flip these pieces so that I end up indexing off a rough factory edge, but a nice cut on this side. And uh, plenty of times I mark these things for a good cut or whatever so I can keep it all organized. Because if you get one of these pieces flipped around and you go through the same sequence, you're going to have uh, one part that doesn't line up with anything else. And that's uh, a pain to deal with. Well, let's see how this audio comes out. I got the G700 running over there. And I um, want to talk about these parts. Uh, everything here has a perfect edge on this side. All these corners are square. And each one of these pieces is the width of uh, two drawer sides. So the wide ones here are two, two nine and a quarters. Then there's two uh, seven and a half, two five and a half, and two three and a half. So I just make this saw setting once and cut all the parts. And I'm starting with the nine and a quarters. Well, I could probably do this uh, video as a standalone, uh, talking about making accurately sized parts, uh, but I guess that's not my reputation uh, for short videos. Uh, so now that uh, all these parts are precisely sized, uh, hopefully I got my cheat sheet right. Um, the next thing is going to be uh, to cut the joinery and slot for the drawer bottoms. So the next thing I'll do is put a groove on the good face and the bad edge of each of these pieces to hold the drawer bottoms. They're going to be made out of this uh, oak veneer material. Same thing I used on the back of the cabinets. It's a uh, nominal quarter inch oak veneer MDF. And uh, as such, it's not quite a full quarter of an inch thick. I really like these Sterrett fractional uh, dial calipers for this sort of work because they show me that this material is a 64th of an inch less than 1 4th. Normally I would use a dado blade to plow those dados, but because it's under a quarter inch, uh, my dado blade doesn't go that thin. Uh, the two outside blades add up to thicker than that, plus they have a special grind on them that doesn't leave a flat bottom when they're used by themselves. So I'll switch to a full kerf, eighth inch uh, rip blade in the table saw and plow the dados in two passes using that blade. And I choose to do all this joinery on a table saw instead of with a router. It can be done with a router, but the table saw is a lot quicker and more accurate. And I think the cuts are cleaner. Uh, router bits uh, on this volume of work, they, even a carbide bit starts to get dull. 
Uh, it smokes a lot, leaves a lot of burrs on the cuts, but using a table saw with a sharp blade is quick, clean, easy, and very accurate. As a rule, I use this uh, four inch forest blade stabilizer. Keeps wobble out of the blade, especially if my feeding, uh, my feed rate's a little fast or unsteady. And this is a Freud uh, full eighth inch kerf, flat bottom grind, eighth inch rip blade. That doubles as a great dado blade for narrow dados like these. Get to talking and forget my washer. And I'll switch out the insert for this wider blade. I made extra drawer parts for setup operations like this. And I want the dado to be a quarter inch deep. And you can get all kind of fancy gauges for setting blade depth. Personally, this is tough to beat. Just make sure I'm hitting my pencil mark at top dead center. Lock the blade in and set the fence to 5 eighths of an inch, which is the distance from the bottom of the drawer side to the bottom of the bottom panel. I'm setting the blade just ever so shallow of the quarter inch and I'll dial it in. Just a touch shallow. I'll go with that. And now I run all the parts with this first pass. I'll mark this setup piece with a capital P for pattern and set it aside. Uh, this whole procedure is uh, beyond monotonous. So um, I'll just tell you that I, I select each piece, find the best face and the worst edge, put that up to the fence and run that pass through it go through the whole stack uh, until they're all done. I'm using a paddle from the joiner for pushing the pieces through because it's faster than a push stick. That datoing process is something I probably should have had chip work on, but uh, you can see all the parts now have a dado uh, plowed in the bottom edge of the good face for the inside of the drawer. At this point, the fronts, of, uh, fronts and backs and the sides of the drawers diverge in the process and um, get different parts of joinery, so I'll separate these out. This is all the side pieces. These are all the fronts and backs, obviously. And they go their separate ways in the joinery process. And the first thing I'll do is put the first part of the corner lock joint on the inside of the faces of all these pieces. And because of the sequence that I use for Cutting these parts, once I switch them over to this orientation, all these pieces are precisely the same length and the width just stair step. It's the same with the fronts and the backs. And that's what modular parts for drawers should look like at this stage of the game. Uh, making the corner joint that I use on these drawers is a two step process. The first one starts out by making uh, an eighth inch, basically an eighth inch crosscut dado that's set back from the end of the drawer side, the thickness of the drawer side. And the second step is putting a tongue on the end of all the front and back pieces. Uh, this way, 
the side pieces run the full length and the fronts and backs run into them. So on the finished drawer, you're not looking at end grain. The drawer front covers this and the sides cover the front and back for a nice clean looking drawer. To make this uh, eighth inch crosscut dado here, I'm going to use that same uh, full eighth inch kerf uh, ripping blade. Uh, in a perfect world, I would switch that out to a flat bottom full kerf crosscut blade, but I don't have that blade. So I'll just use a little slower feed rate with this rip blade and it'll come out fine, especially with the zero clearance insert in there. Using my sample piece pattern, uh, the first thing I do is to change the depth setting on the blade from a quarter inch to an eighth of an inch. I'm just going to mark it out on the side here because it's easier to see. That should do that. Now I want to set the far side of the blade to match up to the thickness of this material. So that those two are just flush right there. And I'm going to run that on a scrap scrap first just to double check my setting. And I like the way that looks for width and according to this sterret, it's 128th of an inch over an eighth of an inch deep and I'm going to go with that. And I'll take this opportunity to mention that uh, I'll put links to these tools like this sterret fractional dial caliper in the video description. The links go to an Amazon influencers page for Next Level Carpentry where you get the same uh, uh, low online price for anything you buy there. But because you used a link from this channel, Amazon pays a small ad fee that helps support video production here. Once I've locked down the settings, I'll run the crosscut dado on my pattern. And if I'm still happy, I'll go through all the parts with this procedure. So all my pieces will look like this when I get done with this step. Again, I'm using a slow feed rate because this is a rip blade and not a cross cut blade and I still want to end up with a nice smooth cut. I've got to remember to do only the inside faces of the side pieces and not start cutting the fronts and backs. Uh, that would be upsetting. And there's not a lot of volume of dust here so I'm just going to let it fill up the cabinet and I'll suck it up later with a dust collector. I don't need the miter gauge for these wider pieces because I can feed them through steadily, but on all the pieces I want to make absolutely sure there's no splinters or crumbs on the ends to throw off the position of the cut. With all the dados put on the sides, the next step is to put a small tenon on each end of all the front and back pieces that fits into this small dado or mortise on the sides. Because I used an eighth inch blade to make this groove, that tenon needs to be an eighth inch thick and an eighth inch long so it fits snugly down into that groove. So I set the height of the blade to this shoulder of the dado here. You can't see it the way it's set up now. And then I put an auxiliary fence on here and brought it over till the teeth are just rubbing on it. And that'll cut away the waste under here and leave that small tenon. I've dialed this thing in for a snug fit. So I'll run one here shows how, and show how it fits. And this tenon ultimately goes on the inside face of the drawer. So I'm putting the undatoed side down and making the cut. But this is just a sample piece. And as the saw winds down, you can hear the teeth rubbing on the face of that auxiliary fence, which assures me that this tenon is an eighth of an inch long. 
Like I said, I already dialed this in for a snug fit. That's how I want it. It holds itself in there with no glue or anything. And if you look here, I hope you can see this, that this tenon bottoms out in that little dado. The shoulder fits tight. There's ever so slightly extra wood sticking out here. That'll make the drawer fit nice to the back of the finished front that goes on there. And this can be flush or in, but I just don't want the front or back to be sticking out past the end of the drawer when it's all done. This is a shade more than I love. That's more than acceptable. This is the kind of fit that I'm after. I have to sand these pieces, but then they get a coat of finish on them. So the sanding will make this fit loose and then the finish will snug it back up again with those thicknesses. If I make this too tight, it'll break off this lug here and make the drawer weak. If I make it too loose, it's just a sloppy fit. That's the sweet spot in the middle. I'll flip all these parts over ahead of time. so that I don't have to think about it when I'm going through the steps. I get both ends with this face down. I do it on all the fronts and all the backs. On a project like this, this is the easiest place to mess something up. So I try to do everything I can to keep things organized uh, because um, it's not unheard of. <clears throat> To accidentally put the dado down and put the tang on the wrong side of every single piece and have it start over. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but that kind of thing can happen. So I do everything I can to prevent it, keep things flowing smooth. And this procedure is about as exciting as watching paint dry. So you can see here how it starts. So I'll just jump ahead until I've got a little tenon on all the ends of all the fronts and backs. Keep in mind that I'm using a slow feed rate because of the coarseness of this blade. If I did a lot more of this, I'd invest in a crosscut blade with a flat bottom grind that's an eighth inch thick. But for this, as you can see with the results, it's more than good. And that's the type of fit and precision I'm looking for at this stage of the game. Any variance here, uh, this piece is just ever so slightly loose. Definitely not a problem or a deal breaker. Uh, generally that has to do with the uh, very, very slight variations in the overall thickness of the plywood. I can get variation like that by putting more or less pressure against the fence, etc. Those tolerances are extremely small that result in those kind of differences. But I think the accuracy of this joinery is pretty tough to beat. I hope you can see why I do it on a table saw. There's not a lot of burrs or burn on here. One wipe with a piece of 120 grit sandpaper is going to more than clean that up and make for some very sweet looking doors. And so that's why I gravitate towards doing this sort of drawer building work using a table saw instead of a router and a router table. Well, I got that monotonous process done of uh, getting the tenons on all the fronts and backs. And this stack of drawer parts is shaping up pretty good. At this point, uh, the front and the back of the drawers uh, diverge where uh, because I slip the bottom panel in from the back and it gets screwed on to the bottom, I rip off uh, this dado and the bottom of the piece. If I was pressed for material, I would have ripped half of these pieces uh, three quarters of an inch narrower from the get go. But because uh, it was all about the scraps, I just decided to wait until now. So what I'll do on the pieces that I want to be the back of the drawer. And if there's a good one and a bad one, I always put the good one at the back of the drawer because that's what gets seen looking into it. Nobody ever sees the inside back of the front of the drawer. So if there's a good one and a bad one, I'll pick the good one and then rip the bottom, uh, the groove off for the back of the drawers. That'll make more sense when you see me put these things together. But for now, that's the next step. So these two piles are now uh, the drawer fronts and these two piles are the drawer backs. And as an example of how easy it is to get 
mixed up. Um, I want all these pieces oriented this way so I can rip off the same amount every time. I don't have to change it for each width of drawer. And I got to reset the fence to make that cut. I'm setting the far side of the blade to this side of the notch. And I'll use uh, one of my favorite push sticks in the quarter inch thickness to push the scrap on out. And that's kind of a cool looking piece of scrap, isn't it? Next Level Carpentry viewers are probably used to hearing me say it takes a lot to be good and just a little bit more to be the best. Uh, and with that thought in mind, there's one more thing I'll do to these drawer parts before uh, screwing them together and putting a bottom in them. And that is to make just a little decorative cutout in the top edges of the sides of the drawers. And I'll use a router table setup to start the process. And I'm going to chuck up this big uh, Freud rabbiting bit into the plunge router I've got set up in the table, mainly because I like the outside cut diameter of this bit. And I'll push it up enough to cut through the half inch. All right, well, I've got this uh, router fence set up, and you go ahead and laugh if you want. I hardly ever use a router table with a router fence, so I just have this uh, shop made fixture here. Uh, it gets everything done that I needed to, uh, but it's not all blue and anodized and sharp looking. So you can laugh at the fence laugh at me, but I don't think you'll laugh at the results. The way this is set up is to uh, put a 3 8 uh, notch, I'll call it, along the top end of each piece, and it starts two inches in from each end, or it starts and stops two inches in from the ends. I've got the pattern piece that I'm going to run this on first before I do the top edge of all the sides. The front and back stay the way they are. Zooming in, you can see that I've got this bit. It's raised up enough to cut all the way through this half inch material. Um, I've got this set so that it'll cut three eighths deep along here. Um, I've got a block on this end to start the cut so that it doesn't kick back on me. And then I just push it through till it stops at this block, which will end the cut right where I want it on this end. Pretty simple process, but it's a pretty big cut. Um, and there'll be some initial bog down as it initiates the cut. But I've got this block back here to keep it from taking off and ruining the piece. This is a job for Smurf gloves and earplugs. I don't have a dust collector set up for this, so it's just going to fly, but that's all right. It's a wood shop. I'll do the pattern if I like it. I'll run through a couple of these pieces so you can see how this works. And that's looking just like I want it. The shoulder starts two inches in from each end of the piece. There's nothing magic about two inches. I just like it for proportion. I think that router or that bit's kind of got a sick bearing. It's going to give out on me one of these times. Like I said, you can uh, laugh or snicker at my setup uh, and this router fence if you like. But I think the results speak for themselves. I've got a perfectly accurate notch on one edge of all the side pieces. There's one more step uh, for milling uh, these sides before I go to screw them together. So the finishing touch uh, for these drawer sides is to put a thumbnail profile on the swoop section of the drawer, just from there to there, not all the way around or anything else. Um, some viewers watched me put thumbnail edging on the shelves in the shop. That was inch and a half thick edging or inch and a quarter. Uh, this is just a half inch thick. I'm using a quarter inch roundover bit and it's not set to the full depth. 
I just take a pass from each face. That gives me a nice thumbnail profile, but it's not a full round over. It's just kind of a subtle detail that I really like. Um, I dialed that bit in for this depth, and if the bit's not set deep enough, there's a flat spot in between the two curves. If the bit is set too deep, it leaves a shoulder on there. I've got one of those here somewhere. This one's got the shoulder, but I don't know if you can see it. So I just play around with it till I get it in that sweet spot and then hit all the edges. Pardon that audio, it's double mic'd. Once I've got the setting where I like it, I lock everything down and then just freehand this thumbnail on all the pieces. And that's all it takes to add that nice little detail on the drawer. And once this is all sanded and varnished, that really stands out as a finishing touch. This whole detail could be done on a router table as well, but I just like the D-handle router and the freehand feel of doing these little thumbnails. And this is what a set of eight drawers looks like before assembly. Uh, I'm going to screw these boxes together uh, to get a measurement for the bottoms, cut the bottoms, put, in, put them in and screw everything together and test fit the hardware before I take everything apart, sand it, and give it a lacquer finish. For holding these drawer boxes together, uh, the joinery gives it quite a bit of strength. I could just um, clamp and glue these and that'd be very strong. Uh, but I'll back it up with some screws. And I'm using uh, a six by inch and a quarter, a small square drive uh, sheet metal screw. Works real nice for this stuff, mainly because of the pilot hole and countersink I get with this snappy bit. And everybody knows I love snappy bits. This is one more example why. I've got this small bit set up so that it's just a little bit short of the length of the screw. So I can run a nice countersink in so the head comes out flush. On these narrow drawers that are three and a half inches, I'll put one screw in the middle at an inch and three quarters. And it's easy to eyeball a quarter inch in from the end so that it ends up in the middle of that half inch thick plywood. With precision parts, this stuff goes together just like I want it. get that countersink and pilot hole going right in there and you can see that it comes out nicely in the end of that wood for a good firm hold. When I lacquer these parts I put a piece of tape on the end uh, to keep the finish off that so when I do the final assembly of the drawers the glue will hold those firmly together along with the screw and the drawer bottom providing strength. That looks a lot less clumsy when I'm not trying to do it for the camera. The back of the drawer is the one that I ripped the dado off of, and it can be installed upside down. And if I throw a clamp on, Oz makes this just a little bit easier. And I'm making sure it's flush on the top of the drawer. I love a battery that's camera shy and quits right in the middle of a job. So that's the first small drawer put together. Um, I'll do the same thing with one of the large ones. Then I can measure the size uh, for those bottom panels. I'll cut those out of uh, quarter inch uh, oak veneer uh, MDF. And I'll show you how those get installed here in a few minutes. With one wide and one narrow uh, drawer box assembled, I have dimensions of uh, 14 and 7 16 front to back, and then 33 and a half, and 23 for width. So using the same protocol uh, for sizing big sheets into small ones that I use for the drawer boxes, I'll do that on the, uh, the rips for the bottoms. I'll make three rips, 14 and 7 16 um, and then cut them to appropriate length, making the final pass on all the sides at the same time so that the drawer bottoms are consistent. And I'm starting with a 33 inch wide rip for one of the bottoms here. I'll get the other strip off of this side. Okay. 
and I'll just freehand cut this end off rather than rip it in half and have smaller pieces of waste. And I put a wavy mark on here so I know that this end needs to be trued up. What I'm doing with those steps is uh, uh, cutting enough so that I can trim about an inch or three quarters off the factory end and then also trim off that hand cut end at 33 and a half inches. Apparently my camera sagged in the process. What I'm doing here is uh, now that all these drawer bottoms are cut uh, to width the 14 and 7 16 I'm squaring up the ends and trimming off the wavy hand cut and trimming off about three quarters of an inch off the factory end. I've got square ends on all this and the quarter inch plywood runs pretty true but I'll double check it just to make sure something didn't get off in the process because the squareness of the bottom will determine the squareness of the drawer and it has to be right on. So all these are good. I can cut them at 33 and a half scant. Constantly checking and double checking to make sure everything's organized and square. That's a good thing because I'm not crazy about those ends. Somehow something's gotten a little off on these pieces and I'll have to true them up with the joiner same as before. Because of the joining process I'm going to make these all 23 and a quarter and then recut for a true straight end. And I guess that just emphasizes the process. I do what it takes to get it square if I got to do it three times and if I overdo it or underdo it. And uh, naturally that's a bit monotonous too. But what I end up with is precisely sized bottom panels for these drawers to make sure that they come out perfectly square for going in the cabinets without trouble. And uh, no surprise here, I've got slight um, roughness on the corners from uh, the table saw. So I'll use 120 grit best block for demanding sanding and give all the edges a quick wipe so that they don't dig in when I put them into drawers. With the first two drawer box uh, frames assembled and the bottoms cut, it's time for a moment of truth to see how we did. Just like that. Two times. That's what I call just the way it ought to be. So I'm going to quickly screw the bottom in so you can see how that works. And I think that'll just about be a wrap. I guess it's pretty obvious by now that I don't use nails or pocket screws on drawers. I, I don't like nails because they can work themselves loose. Um, and it's too easy for them to split out. I guess for some stuff that's fine, uh, but not this. And uh, the other thing I don't like is pocket screws. I, I don't understand why people use pocket screws on drawers. Um, I'm screwing these ends together, but as long as I lay out those screws and put them in there nice and even, um, they provide support and um, like metal dovetails, they just belong there. That's what holds the drawer together. Sounds like my battery got charged up. Um, but I also don't use nail screws or staples in the bottoms of the drawers for the same reasons. I don't, I don't want them rattling and I don't want them splitting out. I make the, uh, the parts accurate enough uh, for the bottom and uh, the drawer fits tight so this drawer won't rack with no screws in the front. I'll put a little bit of glue in there when I put the, 
thing together the uh, final time so it, so it doesn't vibrate like that, but it's really not doing much for strength. Uh, the joinery and the precision are what give the drawers um, accuracy, consistency, and strength, plus a nice look. So I use uh, a smaller snappy bit and uh, number six by five eighths inch screws uh, to hold the bottoms on. I'll just do a quick layout, not that it really matters. I'm going two and a half inches in from each end. I'll put one screw in the middle of 33, 16 and a half, and one in between that of 14, so that's seven. That should do. I just make sure this drawer is all the way in and centered up. Run those pilot holes and screws. And yes, that takes longer than going bam, 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 bam with uh, a staple gun. But if you have one staple that splits out, where does that put you? And that's the procedure I use on all the wide drawers and all the narrow ones for a nice sturdy drawer. And then that rattling will go away when the parts are lacquered and I glue it up for the final assembly. Down to the point where I've just got two more drawers to pre-assemble and I'll zoom in on the process that I'm using, kind of switch it off a little bit to make this go quicker, easier, and more accurately. The bottom drawers are the deepest, so I'm using three screws in these, inch and a quarter down, four and a half down, seven and a quarter down, or seven and three quarters down, that spaces them out pretty well. And I just duplicate that on all these end panels. Because of the tight fit of the joinery, I can just snap these pieces together, putting the back with the good side up, like so. And because everything is press fit, I can set the whole assembly on the floor. And I just make sure that the top edge here is perfectly flush before I drill the pilot holes. And I can use these little number six by inch and a quarter square drive sheet metal screws to hold everything together. By properly pilot holing and countersinking these, I don't get any blowouts in the material. I just get a very, very sturdy connection. And these are aesthetically accurate uh, tolerances for these screw placements. But I can't take the side of this drawer and put it on the side of the narrow drawer like it. There's just enough difference in the layouts that this is a one-off deal. When I take the drawers apart to sand them and lacquer them, I just label everything so it goes all back together the way I took it apart. For a run of eight drawers, this is perfectly practical. If it was 800, it would be worth setting this up in a CNC to make these parts so that they would be universally uh, connectable instead of specifically connectable like they are with my process. These screws are just on the borderline of being undrivable. If it was just a little bit tougher, I'd either make a bigger pilot hole or I'd put some wax on the screws. If it was just a little bit tighter, I'd probably be snapping off heads and that would not be acceptable. Because of the consistency in the parts, the way they were made, once the drawer body is screwed together, I can just pick a bottom, drop it down in there to complete the drawer and I've just got the widest, deepest drawer left to do. There's a little sawdust in those joints and I may have to do a little sanding to ease the pressure in there on the final assembly. Generally though, I'm real pleased when the joints are this snug at this stage, I can always loosen them up. 
having the drawer stand on the floor like this really allows me to bear down with the drill and the driver and the joinery to get everything assembled tightly and in a hurry. And that's the last of the drawer boxes for assembly. So all I have to do is uh, screw the rest of the drawer bottoms into the backs to complete the build process. And to screw in the rest of these bottoms, I'll just go into mass production mode here. And since I want one screw two and a half inches in from each side on every piece, I just made a block that's two and a half inches long for that layout work. That way I can make it nice looking with less effort than any other way. With all the screw holes marked out, I switched to the small snappy bit and the number six by five eight screws for screwing these bottoms in. And I just make sure that the drawer bottom is pushed all the way up to the front so that the drawers come out square when they're all done. As long as I've got an even margin on the back, and that drawer front is driven all the way forward, it's all good to go. If I was to have an uneven margin here, I'd check the groove in the front for sawdust. If chips get in there, it can make things out of square. So as long as the parts are true, I know that an even margin tells me everything's going to come out right. If something doesn't line up, I just look into it and find out the cause and correct it. And I really feel that by working fast and efficiently with the joinery, that any extra time I spend screwing these together instead of blasting them in there with staples, I've already gained early on in the project. Plus I have extra strength with the screws. And I don't worry about callbacks for drawer bottoms busting out. If, if nails or staples get knocked loose. If these screws get knocked loose, I'm going to call that customer abuse. I'll still fix it for him, but it wasn't from me trying to cut corners. One thing I take for granted when doing drawers this way with accurate parts and a systematic process for fabrication, when I put the drawer together, slip this bottom panel in there, the drawers just come out perfectly square. I don't have to hold them square and drive screws to hold them that way or shim or glue or nail it all the way around to get things squared up. They're square from the get-go. So the time I spend early in the process squaring up edges and making sure everything is accurate, it pays off now because I can just put things together, uh, things slip together and come out uh, as close to perfect as they can get without a bunch of extra fuss at this stage of the game. It makes a lot more sense to do the fussing up front so that the end game uh, goes smoothly. So I'm going to finish with the screws in these panels. Uh, I don't know if you can tell it in the camera, but it is one hot, humid night uh, here at Next Level Carpentry. So um, I'm going to get these bottoms screwed in and review the video I shot today making the drawers and decide how I want to wrap this up. Uh, but I think I'll show you uh, one of these drawers installed with that hardware to wrap up the video. Who dog? Feels like it's an August night in Georgia. I use a two-step lacquer process for finishing these drawers. Um, the first coat basically acts as a self-sealer and the second coat gives it a nice sheen. Uh, it's thick enough to protect the wood but not so heavy that it blots out the texture of the grain which gives it a nice look. Once all the parts are sprayed, I gather them up and reassemble the door going by letters and numbers on each of the drawer parts that helps me line things up in reverse order of the way they came apart. By using screws to assemble the drawers, I get a stronger end result, and then I'm also able to disassemble them and use this finishing process so that there's no rough spots on the insides, bottoms, or backs of the drawers when I'm done. Everything is smooth to the touch.
because I masked off the shoulder of this joint, I've got a wood to wood glue up surface here for a nice strong bond. And this is the only situation where I'll ever use water and a rag to clean up glue squeeze out because the surface is already finished so it's not porous and can't absorb glue. Reassembly of the drawers is quick and easy. And if I got my tolerances right all the way through the process, that bottom slips right in there for a nice snug fit. And the screws go right back in the holes as long as I use a Phillips tip instead of that number one square drive. And rather than glue this bottom in uh, to keep it from rattling, I'll just put a very small bead of silicone around the bottom here uh, to keep it from rattling, but not lock it in place. These little clip things are specific to Hedich and is the only hardware required to hold the drawer to its glides along with the two little holes in the back of the drawer, it's secured for the soft close hardware to work. I've pre-drilled this with a 5 16 hole, and then I use these washer head screws to hold the drawer box to the drawer front. The difference in the diameter of the hole and the diameter of the shank on the screw is what gives me adjustability of the drawer fronts when the cabinet's installed on site. That slight bit of movement on each of the four screws helps me align up all the drawer fronts with a nice even margin. The drawer front is piloted, so these screws go right into a pre-drilled hole. And when I snug them down, I can still adjust the drawer front before tightening the screws to hold it in place. To draw all finish and reassemble, I can drop it onto the hardware and snap it into place. You just gotta love it when a plan comes together, right? Well, anybody that's made it through to this point of the video has a pretty good idea of how I make professional grade cabinet drawers. I decided to leave this video one long segment instead of breaking it down into three sections um, so you could just see the whole process all in one place. And I don't want to spoil my reputation for making long videos. If you like what you saw here, if you learned a few things, I'd appreciate if you'd consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already and poke the thumbs up button if you would and let YouTube know that there's stuff going on here at the channel. The countdown to 100,000 subscribers uh, continues, which is pretty exciting, and all of you contribute to that growth, and I appreciate it. To support the channel, make it viable, and keep the growth going, you can check out Patreon, where a growing list of viewers have uh, gone above and beyond and signed up as patrons through Patreon to support the channel. A little bit of support in Patreon goes a long way when measured by the yardstick of YouTube ad revenue. So there's really some leverage there. I'm supporting a Next Level Carpentry t-shirt that you can get at Teespring. There's links right below the video or you can go to Next Level Carpentry's uh, Teespring site. I'll put a link in the video description if you want to pick up any swag to show your support for the channel. I've got a lot of work to do to uh, finish finishing these cabinets and assembling and delivering and installing them. I'll try to get uh, some video once the closet's all complete and installed and at least show a clip on the channel so the people that have seen uh, the edge banding process and the drawer building process can see a little bit what the finished product ends up looking like and what the customer is paying for. These drawer fronts, they're 
basically a flat panel. I've got a video that shows how to make flat panel doors. I use that exact process for making these flat panel drawer fronts for the drawers, if that's something you're interested in checking out. But I keep saying I'm going to wrap this up, so until next time, thanks for watching.